Hi, this is Royce Freeman, and you're watching TTFT, and I'm here with Paul Zaza, legendary composer of many classics as Christmas Story, Porky's, My Belly Valentine. He's worked with several uh, iconic filmmakers, Bob Clark and Paul Lynch, among others. Um, how are you doing today, sir? I'm good. Thanks for having me, Royce. Let's go on the Wayback Machine. Um, how did you get started in the business? Well, uh, as a Basically, as a classically trained piano player, uh, you know, <clears throat> went to the university conservatory, got all my, <clears throat> excuse me, all my, uh, you know, grades and stuff and got, uh, got trained in the classical sense, how to uh, read and play music. And uh, then as a teenager, I started to look at, at other things like rock music and the Beatles and stuff like that and found all that very fascinating. Got into some rock groups, played with some pretty good bands, and um, then later on discovered film and uh, sort of gravitated towards film music because I found it to be very, uh, you know, very much a good way to express music with, with, with a picture going along, whereas all the other avenues were just music you know, audio only, unless you were on stage, of course. They're, but back then, they didn't have all the lasers and the videos and everything. So it was pretty much people went to a concert just to hear the music. But, um, you know, getting that all out of my system, I discovered film. And from from probably early 20s on, I you know, just stayed with film because it's a, it's a fascinating medium. Some of the filmmakers you've worked with, um, it, it seems like Bob Clark seems to be the first one in the in the as far as you worked with him on many projects, so how did you get uh, linked up with Bob? <laughs> That's an interesting story, and I'll try to make it brief. <clears throat> Carl Zetrer, who you probably see on some of the credits uh, with me, uh, went to school with Bob down here in Florida, which is where I am right now, actually. And Carl and Bob grew up together; they went to the same school and. Um, Bob was a very good friend. Bob and Carl were good friends. So but, uh, Carl had done a couple of Bob's early movies like uh, Black Christmas and uh, Children Shouldn't Play With Dead Things, uh, a couple of other pretty low, uh, you know, low-grade film, horror films. Um, <clears throat> and he was, he was fine with that. But Bob and got into a picture that was a big, big deal. It was called Murder by Decree with a big cast and they we're shooting it in London and it was a Sherlock Holmes movie, right? Um, and Carl kind of knew that he, he was a little out of his league with this uh, kind of a score because it was, you know, Sherlock Holmes, 19, you know, 1888, it needed a big orchestral score. It wasn't exactly uh, horror music, right? <laughs> you couldn't just lean on the keyboard and make scary music that way. So he, he knew that someone, he had to get somebody who knew how to write music and conduct a symphony orchestra and all that kind of stuff. So I had met Carl on a couple of earlier occasions up in Toronto, just doing some low end, you know, albums that uh, he, he were, was sort of producing. And then he called me up one night and he said, look, I got this picture that we're going to do in England and I need your help. <laughs> and he called me from London. He says, can you get over here? <laughs> I said, you know, you want me to fly to London like now? And he says, yeah. <laughs> so I said, well, you know, my wife just had a baby and we're, you know, we're kind of up, up in, uh, you know, things are all upside down here, but I'll try and get out you know, maybe tomorrow, or whatever. He says, well, yeah, I'll pay for your ticket and everything and bring your wife and your kid with her. You know, we'll, we'll, you can stay here. I've got a nice old house in England and we'll, we'll, do, we'll work on it. So that's how it happened. I just booked a flight for all three of us and we jumped on a plane and flew over to England and made the music. When you do a, a project that is like based on a character like Sherlock Holmes and there had been you know, the BBC and other versions of Sherlock Holmes stories over the years. Um, did you draw upon any um, thematic uh, threads, uh, inspiration from other films and stories about Sherlock Holmes when you did the music? Not really. Um, you know, all the early films, the Basil Rathbone, you probably have seen these black and white uh, Sherlock Holmes uh, 
iterations that have come out over the uh, cent- uh, the decades. Um, they all they were quite different from one another, depending on who was in them and how the director, you know, set it up. Bob had set this one up in a different way again. This this I don't know if you've seen the movie Royce, but uh, you know it's 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 a little different than the Basil Rathbone stuff. And James Mason played Watson quite differently than uh, oh I can't remember the actor who did it <laughs> in the other ones. So I, I didn't even uh, bother consulting that. I just knew that this is 1888, London. There's Jack the Ripper's out, you know, doing horrible things. So I kind of looked at some of the footage and thought, oh, let's just dive in here and, you know, just whatever comes to me. I, I wrote the music based on how I saw the footage. So that, that was basically it. When you look at the IMDb, it, it's it shows um, a body of work and he worked with uh, Bob on Murder by Decree but then the next film that Bob did uh, Tribute um, it didn't have you listed uh, were you busy on another project um, how did that happen where you skipped that one but you came on to Porky's yeah I think I was doing um, I think I was doing Prom Night at the time I'm going by memory this is decades ago but there was a there was a three picture deal that we did with North Star. It was Prom Night, uh, Melanie, and Curtains, another little horror film. And the three of them <clears throat> were sort of all signed at the same time, and we were going to do them sequentially. You know, Prom Night first, Melanie second, uh, Curtains third. So I, I know Bob went off to do the tribute with um, Gar Strabinsky, I think it was. I'm, I'm just going by memory now. But um, I could, no, I, I couldn't get involved with that because I was I had my you know I had my uh, hands full plus I think at that time we had just won a genie award for murder by decree which happens to be the Canadian version of the Oscar you know so it's a pretty poor comparison but that's what it is so I was you know my phone was ringing off the hook and you know I was getting offers and stuff um, so that one fell through the cracks and I don't think I teamed up with Bob again until Porky's as memory serves, or maybe it was Christmas Story. I can't remember. You, you mentioned being on the set. Did you? Um, ha- what was your work involvement on Porky's? Oh, oh we're on to Porky's now. Well, there was. Uh, if you saw Porky's, <laughs> and I hope you didn't. But anyway, if you saw Porky's, you'll see that there's a couple of scenes where there's a band on the stage, and there's strippers, and there's all kinds of you know chaos going on with music and. They needed somebody to provide music for the shooting of that, you know, that rowdy uh, nightclub called Porky's. <laughs> so I had to go down there and uh, organize some kind of 50s rock band that would, uh, you know, provide them the motivation for what they were doing. So the opening theme of Porky seems to be like a little swanky honky tonk kind of you know it has a it's it's a little dirty but it's it's got some honky tonk and swag um, it, was that something that you composed or was that something that uh, did, did Carl work on that with you as well? Oh, Carl Carl worked on the on the movie. He was the music editor and he took a lot of the stuff that I made and sat in the cutting room with Bob and said, okay. And, does this work? No. Does this work? Maybe. What do you want me to do to make this work? You know, blah, 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 back and forth. I was spent most of my time in the studio with musicians trying to come up with stuff that would work for this picture because being a period picture, uh, you know, it sort of predated my era. I didn't really understand that. It was more 40s, 50s, country, jazz, rock, blues music that was uh, you know, I had to look into it and figure out, well, how does this stuff work? So to answer your first question, <clears throat> yeah, that, I, I wrote that little piece at the beginning, and I had a lot of trouble with it because when I, the first piece I put on, Bob didn't like. He just said, no, 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 it's too, it's too perfect. It's too clean. This has got to be grunge. This has got to be garage. You know, this has got to be like we're in the swamp down in Florida. We, you know, we want to hear – we don't want it to sound like it was produced in a in a studio in Hollywood, right? So 
I fired all the or I shouldn't say I fired. I mean, I let all the musicians go that made the first piece. Bob came into the studio and he says, no, no, no. Let's just just play the drum track. And uh, you see that guitar over there? I said, yeah, that's my guitar. He says, pick it up and just start drumming like this. And, you know, he, he, he actually picked up the guitar himself and he can't play. But he said, I just I want to hear grunge. Right. I don't want this pretty. So I did, and for a little bit of guitar that I know how to play, I started pounding away on the strings. And he says, that's perfect. That's perfect. I love it. That's it. That's it. So we put a little violin on it and put a little harmonica over dub, <clears throat> uh, mixed it. He was happier than a pig, and you know what. So that's how the opening was made. So you worked on the second film, but not the third film. Was it because um, you were busy doing something else uh, with Bob at the time of the third film? The reason I didn't do the music for the third film was because I wasn't asked to do the music for the third film. <clears throat> Bob, Bob didn't direct the third film. So therefore, I would not have been asked to do the music for the third film. Well, it's a shame because uh, you know you're in the first and the second film. There's that continuity of the yeah. you know the uh, the themes and the music and the vibe and yeah. I never even saw the third film, but from what I heard, um, it wasn't good. Yeah, you know they they took all the if there is such a thing as beauty in the first film, <clears throat> and then Bob tried to uh, elaborate on that in the second film, um, which wasn't as good. It, it got too out of hand, you know, and it wasn't working as well as the first one. And by the time they got to the third one, I think people just were tired of Porky's. It's just, you know, it's, it's old news. So it's a good thing he didn't do it. And yeah, he was probably be busy doing, I think we were doing Christmas Story. It could have been that or, or Turk 182. You know, I, uh, it could have been Royce. I, you know, I don't have a timeline all written out here, but um, this can all be researched, but it, it was one of the two. I think it was Christmas Story. That's just the way I'm remembering it, because I remember saying to Carl, you know, I said, Carl, I don't get it. This this guy writes a brilliant script and directs Murder by Decree, which was a classic film, very classy. Then he does Porky's, which was like borderline porno, you know, softcore porn. And then that same mind comes up with Christmas Story, which is about a little boy who wants a BB gun for Christmas. I, I, I don't follow this. <laughs> you know, it's like he's all over the place. Well, I, I remember seeing an interview with Bob Clark, um, the late Bob Clark, and he had said that every one of his stories – like the zanier ones, um, like he went to um, high school in uh, for, in South Florida, right. and he experienced the prejudice that was going on with the Jewish child and the bigoted um, redneck, and he experienced a lot of those stories, or he knew people that were going through those things, and he said, the only way I can tell a story like that is to d disguise it in minutia. So he thought... Um, the dealing with the adolescence coming of age and the sexual awakening and all those things would bring people into the box into the seats in the theater. So he said, "You can't be heavy-handed and just tell a story about bigotry. As teenagers are going to tune out, so I have to disguise it with the uh, the skin flick uh, aspect." Um, so I'm wondering if he was trying to tell meaningful stories, but he also knew that he needed to cater to the audience as well that's going to be viewing it. So that, that might be a reason why he was able to do stuff that was lowbrow and highbrow. Yeah, I mean, it certainly is part of it. Um, I, Bob was a funny guy. He was, he was an enigma because he would, you know, just when you thought you had him figured out, he would surprise you and uh, come up with something right out of left field. And, and you'd say, everybody would say, well, where did that come from? I mean, I never knew him to be a Sherlock Holmes fan. I mean, he, he, you know, as I got to know him later on in the years, he wasn't particularly hung up on period pieces with Sherlock Holmes or anything like that. Yet he was able to write that script and direct that film masterfully. Porky's, no doubt, was a bit autobiographical. Uh, Christmas Story, I don't know if Bob wanted to be begun when he was a kid. I think what happened was he teamed up with a writer by the name of Gene Shepard, 
who wrote the radio plays back in the oh, years and years before all this. He was very successful. And Gene Shepard had a wonderful narration voice. He's the guy narrating Christmas Story. And um, Bob got a hold of one of his radio plays. And I, I think it was called In God We Trust, All Others Pay Cash. I think that's what it was. And, and he read it, and it was about this very, the very topic, about this boy in Indiana growing up who wanted a BB gun, but his parents wouldn't give him one. And he tried to, you know, cajole his way into the school and the teacher and all the whole story that you see. Uh, and Bob was fascinated with it, so he called up Gene Shepard, and they got together, and Bob said, look, I'd like to make a movie of this. I really like, I like the story. Um, and we'll call it a Christmas story. And Gene said, sure, why not? Let's, let's do it. So I don't know that that was an experience that Bob had growing up. He just, he liked it. So he said, I want to make it. And, and throughout his career, you know, if Bob glommed on to something, if he liked something, he'd go to Hollywood and he'd pitch it and he'd fight with the studio heads, do whatever he had to do to control, to, you know, convince them that this is a movie he wanted to make and that should be made. So we're gearing up for the Christmas season. Um, and, you know, tell us some, tell us a, a story about your experiences working on Christmas Story, something that uh, is zany or heartfelt. Well, <laughs> every Bob Clark film had moments of zaniness and heartfelt, you know, moments and, and moments that you just wanted to forget. That was just, that came with the dinner. I mean, with Bob, God rest his soul. I mean, I loved him, but he was, he was, uh, it was always chaotic. And, and you know, the more things descended into uh, chaos, the more he was in his element, if you can put that away, right? He, he loved chaos. He loved the disorganization of everything. It's just, he, he thrived on it. And that was always hard to figure out because, you know, I'd have everything nice and smooth and all the musicians lined up and the scoring and the filming and every, the editing. And he'd just come in and just completely throw wrenches into everything and say, no, no, let's do it another way. And we threw away a lot of good stuff because he just didn't like the orderliness of it. So, like I explained to you on the Porky's theme, right, he just... He wanted it to, maybe it was a control thing. I don't know, you know. Uh, he definitely wanted to direct the direction of the way things went in every aspect, music, movies, the shooting, the, the editing, sound effects, whatever. So when we got to Christmas Story, you know, by this time, this was like the third or fourth film I had done with him, and I kind of expected a lot of insanity, you know, and I got it, you know. The film was shot partially in Toronto and partially in Cleveland. And um, they had a lot of trouble matching the footage from Toronto to Cleveland because if you've ever been to those two cities, you'll know that they don't really look like each other. <laughs> the only thing they had in common is that streetcars are in Toronto and streetcars are in Cleveland. So there's a couple of scenes where you'll see the streetcar going down the street and they're, they're interchangeable. You, you know, to this day when I watch it, I don't know where we are in Cleveland or in Toronto, but it, we they did a good job of um, of cheating it. Uh, they brought the fire engine that's in that famous scene where Flick gets his tongue stuck on the pole. That was driven all the way from a place just outside of Toronto called Chippewa. And they had to drive this because it was the only antique fire engine they could find that still worked. They couldn't find one in Cleveland that matched that vintage. What, what was it, 1943 or whatever. So they drove this fire engine all the way over, and uh, they were concerned it wasn't going to make it because it was pretty old, but it made it to Cleveland and uh, shot the thing. And, of course, there were, you know, we were, I was on the set there, and we are shooting it, and the, half the time Bob wouldn't even show up on time. <laughs> He'd just sleep in, <laughs> and the cast is standing around saying, well, what are we supposed to do, you know? 
But when he finally did come in, he just said, no, 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 take that off, Tim. No, that's, we're going to shoot that over there, move that, get that get that car out of the scene. And he just completely dismantled everything that everybody worked all morning to set up. So that, that was the, the chaos. And, of course, this caused the budget to go over budget. And the, we went over time and ran out of time. And actors were <clears throat> saying, I have to leave. I got another picture. And, you know, all that sort of nonsense happened but <clears throat> we eventually got through it and of course once the film was finished and finally made brought to the studio mgm uh, they discovered that they had just gone through a studio head change and the new guy who took over didn't like this movie and he said who this movie shouldn't have been made who green lighted this thing this is horrible this is about a kid wanting to be i can't you know, go out with, with a film like this in the theaters. And uh, they said, well, you have to. He's got a contract. So the film came out on a, a weekend, and I think around Christmas time, opened on a Friday night, and it closed on Sunday. And they got just pushed it out. They put no money into advertising. They didn't want this movie to be made. They didn't even want this movie to be in the theaters. They just did their obligatory, uh, you know, 1,300 screens or whatever the heck the number was. And uh, the film died. Nobody saw it. And it went into hibernation for probably 20 years until somebody discovered how great it is. And they started playing it at Christmas time on TV, which is about to start happening any week now. So how did you get involved with the sequel um, after uh, Bob sadly passed? Now, there's been a number of sequels. Which one are you referring to? Oh, the one that had um, the, the cast from the original come back, the A Very Christmas Story or a, a Christmas, whatever whatever the title was, the one that came out last year. Oh, okay. I had nothing to do with it. Well, I shouldn't say that. They used a lot of my music from that, from the original. That That movie, I think that was made for TV. Yeah, I believe so. Yeah. That was, I think, Peter Billingsley, who is now an adult, um, talked the studio into making this sequel where Ralphie comes back. I, I never saw it, but I heard that he comes back as a grown-up and visits the house that he grew up in. And, you know, blah, 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 blah. It all went on from there. I never saw it, um, but I know that they licensed a bunch of my music from the original. But there was a, there was a sequel made in the 80s called they originally called it a summer story so it was charles groden was in it barry steenburgen played the wife and kieran culkin played ralphie and this was a movie that was again gene shepherd wrote the script and it was basically a twist on a christmas story only it happened in the summertime so and you worked on the music for that as well i, I wrote the music for that yeah um it, it it was not well received. Uh, for some reason, it didn't capture the same audience that Christmas Story did. And one of the reasons is because probably because it didn't have any of the original characters in it. And it didn't have what, what Christmas Story has going for it is that it's a wonderful time of year and everybody's warm and fuzzy. And now they're watching a, a very warm, heartfelt time of the year in the way Bob you know, got the the kids and the parents involved with all that. But Summer Story didn't have the allure. It's about the kid wants to go fishing with his father. You know, it just didn't it didn't work. Another filmmaker that you um, worked with on multiple projects uh, was Paul Lynch. How did you get uh, involved in working with him in Prom Night? Yeah, Paul Paul um, did the original Prom Night. Basically. I never even met him on the on the set. The the film was produced by a company at the time called Simcom, and uh, they later rebranded or reinvented themselves to be called Northstar Entertainment. But basically, Simcom was Peter Simpson. He was one of the three Simpson brothers who had put together a film company called Simcom, and it was really a tax shelter company in Canada. And if you know anything about a lot of the Canadian tax shelter movies, um, these movies, you know, back in the 70s and 80s came out like a dime a dozen because there was a tax shelter uh, 
stipulation that the government had put in called the capital cost allowance, whereby you could put invest in a film, the Canadian film, and get 100% write-off of your money. So there, there were a lot of movies being made because every doctor and lawyer and dentist in the country was saying, oh, I, you know, instead of giving this money to the government, I'm going to invest in a Canadian film. And so there was a lot of money and there were a lot of movies. So Prom Night was one of them. Peter and his two brothers, David and Richard, made this movie. Uh, you have to remember, these were businessmen. They didn't have a clue how to make a movie. They had no idea what was involved. So what they did know is that they had to hire people who knew how to, to make a movie. So they got a hold of Paul Lynch, who was an advertising, a creative uh, artist working for an ad agency in Toronto. And that's how they met Paul and said, look, hey, you, come here. You want to you want to direct a film? We got a picture. It's called Prom Night. It's about a kid, you know, or about a killing that goes on in high school. Blah blah blah. blah. It's a prom. Blah, da, 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 da. You know, being being Paul. I don't know if you've met him or talked to him, but he's he said, yeah, sure, why not? Let's do it. So they they sat down and worked out a deal, and Paul went on the set and directed Prom Night. And he, I don't think he had ever done anything before either. It's been legend uh, because I actually spoke with. Uh, Paul, um, and he talked at great length about working with Peter Simpson. Yeah, and uh, I'm curious your your uh, take on that experience. Uh, what was it like working with them? And then, what was it that he famously said about I want the music to be close enough to sue, but not enough for them to win. <laughs> That's I don't know where you got heard that, but it's a true story. Well. You probably got that from Paul, but what had happened was that because, you know, these guys were making this movie and they knew that they had to have music in the dance floor for the famous, you know, the prom. These kids are dancing to something, right? So they got all these kids in the in the gym dancing while they're shooting it while this murder is going on. And and they didn't they didn't know what to, to play. So they went to the they sent somebody to the record store and they bought a bunch of disco records. They bought Gloria Gaynor's I Will Survive. They bought uh, the Bee Gees, something. I, you know, they just bought a bunch of disco records and they started playing them while they were shooting. And the kids are dancing and everybody knew the songs and they're saying, yeah, this is great, great. Okay, so finally we get, we get to post-production and then Peter realizes we, we got to buy the rights for these songs. We can't just, you know, put them in the movie. So he got, a, he got his girl on the phone. They started phoning the publishers and saying, okay, how much do we want? How much would it cost for us to use? Let's say, for example, I will survive in our movie. So <laughs> I wasn't in the office, but apparently they quoted a figure that was more than the entire budget of the film. <laughs> And Peter, who was no shortage for, uh, who was no stranger to the F word, <laughs> promptly slammed down the phone with a great big fuck you. And uh, as they went on to try different publishers, they found very much the same thing in Hollywood. They said, look, we got a hit song here. Why would we give it to some dumb little Canadian horror film? You want it? $500,000 a minute. The film only cost a million two to make, right? So, like two songs were going to wipe out the budget. So basically, the same answer: screw you. We're not paying. We're not paying. We're not paying. So my, I get the phone call. Peter says, "Okay, you got to come up with some music to replace what's in there because these bastards want too much money. <laughs> you know, and then, fuck them. I'm not going to, you know, blah 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 blah." I said, Peter. You know, that's a pretty tall order. How many songs do you get? He said, oh, there's about six songs. I said, you want me to write six songs that sound like six hit records? He says, yeah, and you got till Monday. So I'm sitting there stunned thinking, well, not only do I have to come up with six original songs, but I got to plagiarize. I got to make them sound like the other ones. And, it's, and it gets worse because there's a couple of scenes where the Actors are actually mouthing the words, I will survive, as they're dancing. And they put the close-ups of them mouthing, I will survive, in the footage. 
So I said, I don't know how we're going to, you know, I don't know how we're going to get around this. I got to match the beats. I got to match the rhythms and the sounds and everything. So I, uh, I went in to see Peter and I said, okay, well, look, uh, I wasn't exactly trained uh, to do this in the conservatory, you know, rip off people's music. But uh, I said, how close do you want me to come? And he said, you come close enough that we get sued, but not close enough that they win. So again, I had never studied that in, the, in school. So I just went, I went back to the drawing board and I just I did some very careful, um, let's say, <laughs> I don't know how to say this without incriminating myself. I, I, I dissected what made the hit songs a hit, and I used those elements, but changed it enough so that it could be deemed to be original. And I prayed that if that's got before a judge, he would be tone deaf. <laughs> <laughs> So they had multiple sequels to uh, Prom Night, and they all seem to be produced by the same entity, and it says that you did the music for them. Um, yeah. What was the process like working with each film? Because the killer's different in each one, but it's the same kind of vibe. Uh, did you use the same kind of thematic material, or you do? did you treat each one as its own thing? I had to treat each one separately because, again, delving into the history of this, it was a long time after the original, which was a big hit for Peter. They come up with Prom Night 2, which was Hello, Mary Lou, which in my opinion, I think is a much better movie than the original. But that's just an aside. It, it kept the same thematic idea of, you know, a high school a killer. Mary Lou dies. Mary Lou Maloney comes back and starts killing everybody. So that part was the same. But the film had a much different look than what Paul Lynch had, had shot. It was done by um, Bruce Pittman, and he, he just took a totally different approach visually to the film and, and in the editing. So I, I kind of had to stay with the 50s music and, the you know, Hello, Mary Lou and all that stuff. But I kind of got away from some of the sounds and musical themes that I used on the original and uh, took it in a little different direction. And it seemed to work because I think the, the film, you know, plays quite well. In the third one, which Ron Oliver directed, which is more of a cartoon, you know, it's he very successfully managed to mix comedy with horror, which isn't easy to do. But it had a totally different feel to it because there was a lot of slapstick and, you know, in jokes and stupid jokes where you needed scores that were more like, you know, wah, wah, wah kind of thing because there was a pie in the face and, you know, a lot of dick jokes and stuff like that. So you had to have a different approach because this was more of a comedy horror film than the other two were. There was very little comedy in the first two. Then we get to the fourth one, which wasn't even supposed to be a prom night. This was uh, Deliver Us from Evil, which takes place in a monastery with a priest who goes nuts. And, you know, there's nowhere in the film that Mary Lou Maloney shows up. It's got nothing to do with a prom. And, and we, we have this very religious music and theme going on in this monastery while all the killers are going, everything is going on. But that was shot, not supposed to be a prom. It had a different title. And then somebody at North Star said, hey, why don't we make this prom night four and we can capitalize on the success of the first three. So they called it prom night four, deliver us from evil. But it had nothing to do with a prom. So you know, that, the music was different. You had mentioned that uh, there was a three picture deal. There was prom night, uh, Melanie and uh, Curtains. And so... What was it like working on Curtains? Um, you know, I, famously, it's been said that Richard, uh, how do you pronounce his last name? Well, <laughs> there's a big, there's an interesting story to that itself. But the director was let go from the original film. And what they did was, there's a character in there called Stryker, uh, Jonathan Stryker. If you watch the film, you will see at the very head, directed by Jonathan Stryker. Who, who, there is no John. He doesn't exist. There's no real person named Jonathan Stryker. Jonathan Stryker was the character. Alan Smithy. 
Alan Smithy. Who's that? Oh, it's it's a um, it's a thing in a, in a lot of American films when a director takes his name off a film, they they call it Alan Smithy. Um, that uh, so Richard uh, Chuipka, um took his name off the film, and they said that they named uh, the director Jonathan Stryker because they had to g- give the credit to somebody. Yeah. Well, it's even it's more complicated than that. <clears throat> the way I remember it, I think Chupka was kind of either, I don't know if he was relieved or he was told to stay stay off the set because the picture really, the picture really was mismanaged. I mean, it was worse than prom night. I mean, they, they shot, they shot footage and they would come in at the end of the day to look at the dailies and, you know, the, just the three brothers, Peter, David, and, and Richard would just look at each other and just watch, they just watched this film. It didn't make any sense. There's no plot. There's no dialogue. There's nothing. It wasn't scary. It was nothing. It was just a bunch of guys and or people in a, in a house talking. And I, I just remember being in that theater at the end of the day when they would come in and look at this and they would, they'd, they'd look at the film and they start laughing. They'd say, is this thing as bad as I think it is or is it worse? And they'd say, well, I think it's worse. What are we going to do? After a couple of weeks of looking at more footage, they realized, the P- I remember Peter standing up and saying, look, I got half a fucking movie here. What am I going to do with half a movie? Well, it's like having half a car. What do you do with half a car? Finally, they said, well, I don't know. I mean, Peter was on his own. The other two said, look, I'm out of here. <laughs> you know, they, they had other things to do. So Peter said, well, we got to we got to shoot some more footage and make this into a movie. I have to deliver it because there's a tax you know, you have to deliver once you've taken the tax money. You have to come up with at least 100 minutes of something. Right? They didn't have 100 minutes. They had 45 minutes of something that didn't make sense. So somebody got the bright idea, look, well, let's let's go back out and let's shoot a bunch of scary footage and, you know, on a skating rink and let's get a doll who's scary and do close-ups and let's, let's do some scary phone messages and stuff like, you know, whatever. And let's try and make this something Let's try and make something out of nothing is basically what we had to do. So maybe with music and with some special effect, uh, kind of uh, sound effects, we can create this mystique here that something's going on, even though it's never really explained what is going on. As a matter of fact, when I watch the film to this day, I still don't know what it's about. Um, uh, it's got to be about something because a lot of people like it. So, you know, there was uh, there was a lot of uh, a lot of chaos uh, on that particular one. The film took a lot longer to finish than it was supposed to. So, there's a song that's playing during the ice skating uh, rings, um, and it's actually a, a song song. Like you can you can find a record of it. You saved my soul. Uh, did was it picked by Peter Simpson, or did as yeah. working on the music? Did, did working on the music? Did you help provide that song? No, I had nothing to do with that. It, Peter, I don't know if you've ever heard of a, a rock a rock star in Canada called Burton Cummings. He's he's written a lot of. He was a member of a, gr- a group called the Guess Who, and they were very very successful. They had songs like "Taking Care of Business" and "Save My Soul" and a whole bunch of big big number one hits in Canada. Peter and Burton are friends. Okay, Burton Cummings wrote "Save My Soul" and he sings it. So Peter kind of said, look, we need something in this movie because the movie doesn't have much going for it. So can we license your song? And Pete Burton gave him a good price. And they said, yeah, okay. So that's, that's how that got there. The movie has an – it's imbalanced, uh, you know, being, gener- <laughs> being generously putting it that way. Uh, the middle part of the movie was directed by the original director, but then the, the opening and the ending is stuff that Peter uh, – added on was it was it hard in the scoring of the film to do stuff that was tonally so different because there was all this uh, slow building stuff that the original director had done and all the new stuff that peter added was you know slasher stuff not really i mean it was you know it was just it, it all fell within the same genre it had to be you know scary it had to have tension it had to 
be evocative. It had to, it had to do all the same kinds of things in just different ways, much like any any horror film, right? You don't just have ninety minutes of scary, scary music. You have to balance it off with some slow music, and sometimes you have to slow it down in order to speed it up, and vice versa, right? So no, I, I just and, and you got to remember this film took a long time to finish. So parts of it were scored, and then the film was put on the shelf for maybe three months. Nobody worked on it. It just sat there. We all thought it was going to die. And then it came back, and then more footage was added, and then it sat on a shelf for another six weeks until somebody got some more ideas, and then it came back. So when it went all, was all said and done, we, we had a film that was kind of stitched together over maybe a year, and that's, that's my memory of it, about a year. In post-production, I mean, that's, that's a long time. So, I, I mean, by this time I had done other movies and I was starting to look at, I even put pieces from Prom Night in curtains just because it, it seemed to work. And we stitched it all together and um, we finally got it delivered. And out it came to much, to no fanfare at all. I don't even think it made it to the theaters. But, <laughs> you know, again, it's one of those weird things where, decades after the fact somebody discovers it and uh, there's a little bit of a cult following now for for curtains some of the other um canadian um films of the of the day were uh, that you worked on like my bloody valentine um was what was the process like working on that and also writing the ballad of harry warden <laughs> yeah well that well two questions there it was shot that was a montreal company not toronto and uh, it was a low-budget film, and John Dunning and uh, Andre Link had teamed up to make this film. Again, a tax shelter film, Canadian. Um, and for some reasons, it had to be shot in Nova Scotia, which is a province out on the eastern seaboard of Canada. Uh, there was a mine there, an abandoned mine, that they somehow got the rights to, or I think they basically said, can we, they just asked the, whoever owned it. It had been shut down for years. And they said, can we can we go in your mind and shoot a horror film? The guy said, sure, I don't care. Go ahead. Didn't even charge them. So they go take a film crew out there and go down a mine shaft, an elevator shaft, you know, bring an entire film crew down like 200 feet below the earth, which is very dangerous to do. I mean, there's all kinds of gas and crap, and nobody had been down there. They didn't know you know, if any of the supports were still in place. They, they, George Mahalka, to his credit, brought a film crew down there and shot this film with his, with his cast using the tunnels and the train and, you know, all the mine stuff to create a murder mystery that would, would allegedly, well, it did, took place on Valentine's Day. That's what the original script had called for. What they didn't know is that Valentine my bloody valentine was going to be set in a mine that just it just worked out that because of the extremely low budget they could shoot there for next to nothing and they could go to nova scotia and get hotels and food and car you know all the stuff you need when you're shooting a film very very cheaply plus i think they got some kind of a, a nova scotia tax write-off too or help with with the government because they were just so happy to have you know something going on in their little little town. It's called Sydney Mines, I think it was called. So that film went out and they shot it and came back and we looked at all the footage of this, this stuff going on on Valentine's Day. So the second part of your question is Harry Warden. Well, Harry Warden is a character in the movie who you actually never see. He is the one they think was committing all the murders until we find out at the end it wasn't Harry Warden at all. It was one of the miners. It was one of the kids. Uh, Axel, I think his name was. Yeah, that was brilliant, calling him Axel, because he kills everybody with an axe, right? <laughs> anyway, yeah. so, they, so they, the, the film shot, it's Harry, Harry Warden, who I still don't know who Harry Warden is, but he kept, they keep talking about him in the movie. So Harry Warden, whoever he is, got a sort of uh, exoner. He didn't do the murders. So does that make Harry Warden a good guy? No, he's still an evil man, but nobody knows what he did years and years ago, but it wasn't good. 
So we're sitting at the end. We're in the, we're in the theater in Montreal screening the thing. And the credits are going by at the end. And John Dunning says, we need some music for the end. What are we going to do? I said, well, I don't know. What do you want to do? He says, I think we should have a song. Right, because that's what people do when they make movies. They put a song at the end. Oh, is that what they do? Okay, put a song at the end. Well, we don't have any money. Oh, well, then how are you going to put a song at the end? He said, you're going to write one. I said, oh, well, what do I, what do I write? They just killed, he, they killed a bunch of people. It's a very down ending. What do I write? Tiptoe through the tulips? He says, no, 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 Carl, you just come on. I don't care doesn't matter because nobody's in the theater at the end anyway. <laughs> Just write something and put it on. I said, all right. So I went back to, to Toronto into my studio, and I said, uh, what the hell am I going to write here? I can't put a disco song. I can't put, uh, you know, uh, I, I, I really didn't know what to do. So I, I watched the movie, and I thought, I know. We'll just tell the story over again in a song. We'll call it a ballad of Harry Warden. So the song, if you listen to the song, it said, once upon a time, in a long time ago in a town they called, you know, I just told the story to this sort of balladeer, sea shanty kind of, you know, whatever you want to call it, a ballad, uh, retelling in three minutes or less the story that everybody just saw. And put it together, hired a guy to sing it, put it on the movie, and they said, yeah, yeah, it's fine, good, no, we don't care, you know, whatever. It turned out years later, I got a call from, uh, I think his name was Roth, Eli Roth. Yeah, he's a director, friend, good friends. And he, he, was, he said to me, you know, Quentin and I and a bunch of his friends get together at his house, uh, you know, on the weekends every now and then. We like to play the song and sing along with it, the ballad of Harry Warden. So I said, wait, wait a minute, let me get this straight. You guys buy, put a DVD on, wind down to the end, and you all get up and sing along to the ballad of Harry Warden. He says, yeah, we love it. He says, would you happen to have a clean copy of it so we don't have to use this, the DVD all the time? So yeah, I got a clean copy of it. I'll, I'll send it to him. <laughs> so, so I, I sent it off, and I'm just still standing there scratching my head saying, why would anybody do that? Well, it's just like having a Rocky Horror Picture Show or films like that where they have midnight screenings. Um, people are connected to things on a primal level. You don't know why you're laughing at a joke. You either do laugh or you don't laugh. Music and art connects to us on that level. It's and it's different for everybody. You know, one person's uh, treasure is another one's trash, you know, and vice versa. Yeah. I mean, it, it's, I mean, there's films that are classics that aren't necessarily good. And there's films that are amazing that have no following, you know, because yeah. they're not commercial enough. I mean, uh, go figure. Um, were there films around that time, because they were made by the similar companies and around, you know, some similar filmmakers. Were there films you were offered that you actually had to turn down? Yeah, there, I mean, there were a couple that were just either because of scheduling or uh, personalities. You, you got to remember too, you know, when a composer works with a <clears throat> with a director or a producer, there's a it's a very um, there's a bond there. There has to be. Um, like I, I know with certain directors, they s just swore by me. They said, oh, I'm, you know, I'm very loyal. I'd never use anybody else because, you know, you know, you understand me. You know what I'm thinking. And you know how to translate that into music on the screen that supports my work, right? So I don't want to have to fight with, uh, with you. So there's that bond that you have, which is why you'll see the same directors on a lot of my pictures, the pictures I did. Um, so either... I was busy working with those guys and had no time. Or there's a couple of cases where I met with the director and, you know, he, I just said, no, I, you know, I, I can't work with this guy. He's just, he's a jerk. And he's just, you know, he's just, I, I don't, I don't know where his head's at. And I won't name names, but there, there's a couple of big pictures that I turned down just because I couldn't get along with the guy, you know? And there, there was a couple, too, that were just so bad. The movies were so bad. I just said, no, there's no way I can put my name on this. 
The producers that made My Bloody Valentine, they worked on um, Happy Birthday to Me, which was another um, Canadian film that was a bit of a thriller. And I don't know if it was made before or after My Bloody Valentine, but was that were you offered that film? No. No, I wasn't. Uh, I don't know who did, who did that. I don't think I've ever even seen it. There were th- That same company did some films called uh, Terror Train. They did a slew of them that I wasn't involved with. They brought me back later on when Don Carmody teamed up with the two. There was Andre Link and John Dunning, and they teamed up with Don Carmody, who had a tremendous success with Porky's. He was one of the producers on Porky's. So Don uh, knew me from Porky's and uh, said, well, we're going to work with him again. We're, we're, uh, there was another two or three picture deal. I think we did a picture called Meatballs 3, was the sequel to Meatballs, the one with, remember, Bill, Bill Murray was in it. Uh, and there was another one called Frankenstein 88, a horror film, but they ended up retitling it to The Vindicator. So I had worked with the Montreal Connection once again on these movies, but I never did another horror film for them after uh, My Bloody Valentine. There's been uh, remakes uh, to films that you've worked on. They, you know, they remade Prom Night. Um, they remade My Bloody Valentine. And I wonder, um, have you ever seen any of those remakes? And if so, what did you think of them? Uh, I started watching. One of them, I think, My Bloody Valentine, and I think I got about halfway through it, and I just said, no, this <clears throat> this doesn't have what George Malka, the original director, he he had a vision and he made it work, even with no money and a, basically a crew, uh, you know, a staff, uh, what do you call it, a cast that was unknown. He, there was a magic in what he did. And when I watched the sequel, which I think was in 3D. Yeah. I just said, I, I don't, I'm not, I'm not feeling it. No, I'm not feeling it. And I know that a lot of produce, a lot of, of these films, like Carl did Black Christmas, and when he went to see Black Christmas too, which he had nothing to do with, he said it was unwatchable. He just, he said I couldn't, you know. It, they took all the magic that Bob Clark had put in and just sucked it all out of it. It was just, it was, you know, a non-event. So we we tend to you know these films that are hits that they they try and milk it and come out with you know get some more money out of out of the title on rare occasions it works but usually it doesn't in the horror the horror genre I find you worked on a film that Bob Clark produced but didn't direct Popcorn what was that experience like <laughs> Well the truth of the matter is he did direct it but. He sort of directed it by remote control, if you can figure that one out. <laughs> For, I, and to this day, to this day, I don't know why he refused to put his name on it. I don't know why. We were down in Jamaica shooting that film. Bob very much controlled everything. He controlled the, the shooting, the set, the cast, the music. Every detail of the film was controlled by Bob Clark, which, to my way of thinking, Makes him the director. Yeah. But for reasons I still don't know, he didn't want to be accredited as the director. So he got Mark Harrier, who was one of the guys, one of the kids in Porky's, was one of the boys. Mark came on and he, you know, he was there. He did some work. And Bob just said, hey, you know what? You're the director now. (laughs) So Mark said, fine. And uh, he stayed with it to the end. He had some good ideas. Mark's a great guy. But Bob, for my money, you know, Bob pretty much called the shots. So if I remember correctly, I mean, it, it's shot in, in Jamaica, but it's, I don't think the story is supposed to take place in Jamaica. So did they, um, was it difficult trying to bal- balance that vibe of, well, it is Jamaica, the extras, everybody in the background, you can tell it's not here. And then they playing all this reggae music. But then you're also trying to make it something for the American marketplace. You know, again, usually be behind all of these films, there's a there's a story. There's there's a reason why all this happens. There was a lot of money, Jamaican money, that went into making this movie. 
And I won't get into names and details, but let's just say it was financially very uh, advantageous for them to shoot in Jamaica. They could get access to all kinds of things, hotels, food, trucks. The only thing they didn't have was a lab. So the film was shot on 35 millimeter film, which was the way they used to do all of them. And they had to ship the negatives to Miami every day to be developed because there was no lab in, in uh, the islands. So that, that meant that every day we were a day out. We couldn't look at dailies because we had to wait for them to be developed. The negatives, they'd do a, a print and send it back to Jamaica. And we'd be looking at films a day later dailies which is not a good thing to do because if you're set is you're set up and you need to do the reshoots you want to be able to go back in on the same or you know or the next day and do it without striking the set so this caused a lot of budgetary problems with um shooting and editing they also had to fly the editor down there and set him up in an editing suite which is back then it was non-existent there were no film editing suites in jamaica they didn't make movies in Jamaica. So, you know, there, there were a lot of problems, but I guess the advantages outweighed the disadvantages, so they shot the film in Jamaica. And then as to where are we in the film, where are we supposed to be? Good question. We could be in New York. We could be in L.A., Chicago. We don't know where we are because, you know, for a lot of the movies, we're sitting in a theater watching a movie within the movie that we're watching, right? So that could be every city has theaters, right? And then killers are walking around in the theater killing people while they're watching a movie. You know, in, in Canada, there was the, the, uh, the boom of those uh, tax incentive films and stuff. And then in the 90s, in the late 80s and then into the 90s, you started to notice this. Um, I've heard it described that films like Fatal Attraction and Basic Instinct and films like that, that they're basically slasher movies, but they're done with class, or they at least try to do them with class. They try to make A pictures out of B pictures. And so the boom of having late night, um, uh, I guess they call it skinamax, you know, when it's very sultry and erotic, but it's got a murder plot, you know, um, there was a movie called Blown Away, which was kind of like a teen teenage version of Body Heat. You know, I want you to off my such and such, you know, and let's get away with it. What was it like working on that film? Uh, it was another North Star film, as I recall. There was, that was a period where Peter Simpson was shooting them. I mean, he was spitting these films out like, oh, three or four a year because he had a great deal going with another company and blown away was was shot and finished very quickly i don't remember much about it except that it had to it had to uh have a beginning middle and end and get out the door by friday so i kind of drawing if i if i watch the film again i could probably give you more information but i don't remember much about it sorry well, I, I noticed that it did mention that there was like uh, source music. Uh, is that a common thing that when you're doing the score that you'll also be uh, asked to do uh, stuff that's going to be playing on the radio or, or just songs for the film as well? Oh, yeah. Yeah. I mean, almost every film, unless it's a real f film noir kind of thing, they're going to either be in a restaurant or a car with a radio or a nightclub or a bar scene. So, you know, you're going to be somewhere where there's going to be either a band or some kind of media playing. Sometimes it's a television set that's on. I've even been asked to do that, to do fake TV shows that are playing in the background while the actors are in the room supposedly watching TV. So, yeah, source music is very... You get away with a lot with source music because nobody's listening to it, and it's usually filtered very heavily. So if it's if it's coming out of a radio in a car, it's going to be filtered down, and it's usually the actors are talking over it, and you got the sound of the car engine going, and all these. It, it, the music is more of a sound effect than it is a piece of music. If you know that your music is going to be treated in su as such where it's going to be put through that process of being – it's supposed to be on a radio. And yeah. you know – and you know um, f 
you know, phonically, how sound is treated, do you work backwards from the end result knowing, okay, if I do the music this way, it's going to come and I, and I, it has the radio filter put over it. It's going to have this desired effect. Do you have to know how it's going to sound later when you create it initially so that the filter doesn't screw up your music? Well, first of all, I don't care if the filter screws up my music because nobody's listening to it anyway. If <laughs> you're supposed to be listening to what the actors are saying, if you're focusing on what's coming out of that car radio, <laughs> you know, you've already lost the, the battle here. I mean, okay. I mean, that's just basic filmmaking 101. You you don't care what the car engine sounds. I mean, you don't listen to the car engine and say, hey, that sounds like a Mazda or no, that's 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 a Mercedes. Uh, you, you don't do that. You, you just accept that there's a car motor running and there's a radio playing. And I really care about what the actors are saying, in the, you know, or, or if it's a car chase that's going on, you know, you don't even hear the radio because of the sound of the tire squealing and the, you know, the police sirens chasing them and all that kind of stuff. So um, source music in movies are sort of at the bottom of the totem pole at the end of end of the scoring session that, you know, I, I say, all right, now we got to have something here. We got to have something here. Half the time, it doesn't matter what you put in because nobody's going to pick it out. Nobody's going to care uh, unless the song is featured, yeah. like like we talked about in um, Prom Night, right? Where it's obviously playing a crucial role in the the the. But they're dancing to a song. You're going to have to hear it. Yeah. So so if you know the music is going to be featured. <laughs> I guess this is a hard question to ask any artist, but do you, they call it, I guess, throwing away. Like I, I, I did it, but I threw it away. You know, I, the stuff that you know, isn't going to be as featured. Do you treat it differently in the creative process of, you know, it's not going to be as important. So it's just something that you put uh, a little less into, or uh, I don't know the best way to ask that, but. Yeah, I know you've, you've, you've done a good job, Royce. Uh, exactly. It's not a priority. So, um, and most of the time, most of the time, I didn't even make the source. Movie. I just used something that I had in my library, right? Some piece of bluegrass twang, you know, country hick music that I might've had. And if it, if it fitted the scene, like in a movie like Bullies that we did, you know, it was a small town and they're all sitting around drinking beer and, you know, it was a very much a country hick kind of thing. So you put a piece of bluegrass music on and it's playing on the, on the jukebox. If You know, in those days they had jukeboxes. So it, it would, I never, I mean, I shouldn't say I never, there were cases where I had to make the source music just because I simply didn't have anything that fit. But I wouldn't put a lot of time or money into it because it's, Again, I'm repeating myself. Nobody's really going to hear it. So many filmmakers you've worked with on several occasions. Uh, one of them is Sidney J. Fu Sidney J. Fury. Uh, do you have any experiences working with him? Oh yeah, a great guy. I, I'm not even sure if he's still alive. Um, Sid did some really nice films back in the '70s, '60s, and '70s. He's an old time director, an old one of the one of the true greats of uh, of uh, that era. And he really understood and knew how to shoot an action scene and how to shoot a dramatic, a dramatic film. And uh, I got along really well with the guy because he he was just an artist. He was just really good. I, I think as he got older, uh, he slowed down, and I don't think he was doing too much because just the physical, uh, you know, the amount of physical uh, energy that it takes to to go out and shoot a film, especially an action film is, you know, you, you gotta, you gotta have your energy. <laughs> and Sid was up there. Sid said, when I worked with him, he was up there. So each filmmaker has a different temperament and style. Um, what is a filmmaker? What are the differences between Bob working with somebody like Bob Clark versus working with somebody like Paul Lynch? Cause you've worked with both of them several times. Well, just like everybody's different, you know, I mean, it's hard to find two people exactly the same. Even though the medium is is pretty constant, you've got 
film, you're shooting actors on film, you're putting music on those actors on the film. That is constant. But the, but the way these things are approached from a directorial standpoint is, I mean, they're all different. Some, some of these guys are do it completely opposite to the way some of the other ones do it. Like, for example, Bob, Bob was not one to plan things. He would, in his mind, he would have all the camera angles kind of figured out, but he could just as well show up on set, usually late, and uh, change everything. So if in one of the production me pre-production meetings, he would say, all right, we're going to shoot this from this angle. I want the camera to come in through the door. I want to see the actors by the windows and blah. So the set designers and the you know all the people that make the movies work, you know, they, they'd set up based on the meeting. So it would all be set up. And I think I mentioned this earlier on. Bob would show up, you know, an hour, two or three hours late and come in and say, no, 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 no. They, they, I don't want, I don't want to, no, you shouldn't be doing it like this. And these guys say, well, this is what you told us to do. No, well, it's wrong. Don't, don't do it. Let's, let's do it from the reverse angle. We'll shoot through the window. <laughs> so they got to take everything out and reposition everything. That was his style. But then you get a guy like Lynch who was used to working very much as a creative uh, art director. He would have everything mapped out and he would go in and do it exactly the way he mapped it out with very little, you know, sometimes there'd have to be changes logistically if something out of the ordinary happened. You know, and, and that could happen too. These, some of these directors, Sid was like that too. He'd have everything lapped up. But say, for example, they've got it all set up and they find out that they get to the set and it happens to be beside a railroad track. <laughs> and they didn't know that at, you know, 1246, this train goes barreling through and it's going to, you know, destroy the sound. <laughs> so, so they've got to, you know, sort of, uh, change direction on this on the fly uh, but for the most part these guys they would go in and stay pretty much true to the script you know uh, bob clark has worked on theatrical productions and worked on some t stuff on t television like um he worked on amazing stories um and paul lynch also has done m much uh, a lot of television as well um murder by night was a film that he did a tv movie and we worked on that what is the process that's different between doing a theatrical film and doing something is the is the format on television f different than th uh, theatrical features yeah very much so i mean tv and i've done a lot of tv is the the bar is much lower you know, on every respect, it takes they they don't have as long a shooting schedule, an editing schedule. Um, usually, if you're doing an MOW right, movie of the week or a mini series or something like that, there's very much a broadcast date that is, you know, is is scheduled. So they know this film has to be finished and ready by this date, and that date isn't usually that far ahead. It's, it could be, you know six weeks, two, two months, three months, whatever. But with a feature film, I mean, they're, they're shooting feature films in Hollywood right now that aren't scheduled to come out until 2026 because they've got a much longer um, run-up time and, and the process itself is much more expensive and time-consuming. The average Hollywood film now is like $200 million. Well, you don't put $200 million into a TV movie. Actually, I shouldn't say that. Netflix, Netflix probably does, but um, I don't know how that's going. But uh, anyway, the most TV movies that are done by you know Hallmark and A and E and all the different uh, guys, Nickelodeon, those kind of broadcasters, they they don't put that kind of money in. Moving over to television or staying with television, um, what was it like working on a running series, Rin Tin Tin? Yeah, that ran for five years. Um, um, Rin Tin Tin was, was a remake of a series that ran back in black and white back in the 50s, I think. Same guys, Burt Leonard and uh, Peck Pryor. Um, so these guys were quite quite a bit older, and they came up and they, again, locked onto that Canadian tax shelter deal, found there's some great money there, 
and uh, let's shoot this thing in Toronto. Let's shoot the series. And this was sort of their swan song because these guys were pretty much up there in their mid, mid 70s to late 70s by this time. So they found a way to team up and uh, shoot the series in Toronto, which um, I, you know, I, I, again, I'm not sure why the series was a success. I mean, it was the it was the basic idea was a German Shepherd who saved the world every week, right? I mean, he was he's the dog. The the original series was called Cats and Dog, K A T T S, and Dog. Cats was the police officer. That was his name. The story or the the episodic uh, Bible, if you will was that the cop and his best friend, the dog, would go out and save the world every week, okay? So because of some logistics in the Canadian tax shelter law, and, and again, this is just government being, you know, what they are, they said, okay, you can call it Rin Tin Tin in the States, but in Canada, we have to have a Canadian name. We don't want an American name on it because this is a Canadian TV show and this has got Canadian money in it and it's got Canadian actors and a Canadian composer. So we want a Canadian title. So we couldn't call it Rin Tin Tin in Canada. So they called it Cats and Dog. K-A-T-T-S and Dog. And that became a problem because every week, you know, every time they edited, they had to have two different titles on the film at the beginning and at the end. To make matters more interesting, the American TV episodic running length was different than the Canadian running length. So we had to have two versions. And then it got ugly because somebody said, well, the dog's name isn't Rin Tin Tin because that's the title of the show and we can't have that in Canada. So you have to give the dog a new name. Well, what do you want to call him? Well, let's call him Rudy. Oh, that's brilliant. How long did it take you to come up with that? So Rudy was the dog's name. The problem was that every time Cats had to talk to his dog, they had to shoot it twice. Once calling him Rinny, which was the short the nickname for Rin Tin Tin, and then shoot the same friggin' scene again, calling him Rudy. So that meant every time there was a reference to the dog, we had two versions to do. <laughs> and it's just made the, the, the schedule take longer and it cost more money. And they had to, del they delivered to uh, CBN in the States in Virginia, which was the Christian Broadcasting Network. They were one of the financing. That's where one of the big pieces of the money came from. Another piece was from the Canadian broadcaster, CTV, which is Canadian Television Network. And then the third piece was from the government itself, good old Telefilm Canada, who put up a third of the money. But you had to satisfy each one of these broadcasters in order to keep the thing alive. And that meant, like I just said, a lot of uh, duplicity and, you know, shooting things two different ways. But we got through it for five years. We got through it. Depending on which filmmakers you talk to, uh, I've saw an interview with Cronenberg where he talked about this, but other filmmakers like uh, Paul Lynch weren't aware of these um, controversies that in the 70s and maybe into the 80s, but the Canadian government, or at least some of the provinces, if you had certain types of material in your film that was not uh, up to their moral standards, um, they would force you to cut your film a certain way and take it out. And if you, you, would, you would go to jail if you were to put that material back in. Were you aware of any of that uh, censorship back in that day? No. They were more concerned with people doing some nasty things like, you know, having a bottle of Coke in every scene, right? And they would, they would you know make a deal with Coca-Cola and saying, okay, we're going to sneak your product in in every scene and you're going to give us, you know, a couple of hundred thousand dollars. And basically we're going to sneak commercials into the film without anybody knowing it's a commercial. That kind of shit went on and it still does go on. But you have to be very careful because if you do it and you're too blatant about it, you're going to get called out on it. And uh, 
you know, that that doesn't that doesn't happen much in the Canadian films because they have enough bureaucracy to worry about anyway with the government. You know, uh, you don't want to be accused of making a ninety-minute commercial for somebody. Have you noticed a, a shift from the time you started working in film to today, as far as any of the the way it's done? Because now you have streaming and you have video and and uh, digital and stuff that wasn't available back then. Has the the technology changed how your work is done? Oh yeah, the technology's changed dramatically. Not just with the shooting and the fact that nobody, I don't even know if they shoot on film anymore. I mean, there's so many variations of IMAX and uh, HD. And I mean, I don't even know where it's at now. Technically there's just so many ways to shoot a film and make it look good. Right. But from the audio standpoint, uh, that's changed a lot too, where, you know, used to have to, I still have the studio, but uh, there's not much film music going on in there anymore. But that's a building full of big recorders, and t microphones and stuff. But now a composer can make a film score on like this laptop that I'm talking to you on. Right. That's the whole studio. <laughs> so, you know, you can take that with you anywhere. After the tragic passing of Bob Clark, um, and his last film, The Karate Dog, your credits seem to kind of shift from composing to other musical arranging and stuff. Um, discuss the process of, you know, how that shifted. You know, we're talking about a, something that took 10, 15 years to, to, uh, to change. The, the best way to answer that is that the industry, the film industry and television industry, has changed a lot in the last um, 10, 15 years. Um, the way they make them, the way they finance them, the way they, you know, everything about them uh, has changed. And I found that, you know, after all these, these people, they were, in Bob's, Clark, Bob's case, he just got killed tragically in a car accident. But um, some of the others just kind of got old and, you know, they, they, they couldn't make it. So they, they sort of died off. And uh, I was faced, whereas I was saying, am I going to go out now and meet a bunch of new younger directors? I've got to reintroduce myself. I've got to try and get in with somebody and gain the loyalty and trust that I had with these guys or look at some other things. And based on what I saw, the way they make movies now, and unless you're working on a big, you know, like a Hans Zimmer picture in Hollywood, you don't get the big, the money. And the, and, and the studios now, they don't make films the way they used to, where they would give a guy like Bob Clark or, you know, uh, a director who they trusted, they'd say, all right, you got full reign. Here's the money. We trust you. You've got a good track record. You're a bankable director. Go and make the movie. Um, they don't do that now. Films always end up in a boardroom where a bunch of guys in suits and ties are sitting around and saying, well, I don't think this is, you know, and you end up with like, you know, a big committee making a decision on a tiny little artistic uh, point. And I've been in a couple of those situations where you just got people, these movies are made by committee. And the best example of that is just look at what Disney's been doing lately. You know, these these movies are manufactured to uh, to to satisfy a whole bunch of needs, and everybody in that boardroom has a say. And then I don't know what they do. Do they vote, or they, I don't know how they decide on what what ends up happening. But I didn't. I don't like working that way. I like to work with a guy who has a vision, and he's going to go and make that vision a reality. And I'm going to work with him and try and help support his vision. That's the way I remember filmmaking. Um, and I got into a little bit of this towards the end with two pictures, one called Baby Geniuses, which was a Bob Clark film. And uh, The Karate Dog was another one where, yeah, Bob was a director, but every time there was a decision to be made about, like I say, a musical cue, we had to have a big meeting with a bunch of people who had no idea what, filmmaking was these were suits you know these guys are just you know 
They're finance guys, but yet they all got into that meeting and they were starting to give direction. In fact, the best example of this was a film called Loose Cannons with uh, Gene Hackman and Dan Aykroyd, Dom DeLuise. I don't know whether you saw that on IMDb. DB, Bob, De, Bob directed no. that film. <laughs> that film, and I know we don't have a lot of time left here, but I'll make it short. That film had to have two scores for the same movie two different scores because the director, Bob wanted one score, which he had definite ideas about and the producer and his gaggle of people, <laughs> I'll be trying to be kind here. They had a much different vision of what version of what the music should be. So they would argue and argue and argue. And I'm stuck in the middle because I'm saying, well, look, you guys fight it out. Let me know what you want. I can't, you know, I can't serve two masters here. I thought I was serving the director. And uh, finally, the only way to solve this problem was we had to score the same picture two different ways, which I got paid twice for, by the way. And they had to screen the pictures. They do what they call preview screenings, where they take the, the you, know, you know all about that. So they go in the, the picture with Bob's version, and then they go into the picture with, the other guy's version. And then they would score them, and get the audience's reaction and see who got a bigger number. And whoever got the higher number in the previews wins. Well, if you can, the extension of that, if you, you carry that forward to now, uh, say a way a Disney film or a Lucas film or somebody like that makes a movie and the boardroom has, you know, there's a bunch of guys, you could have five different versions of the same movie going out and being tested. Well, that reeks, you know, how does a composer do that? I mean, that's, and it wouldn't be bad enough if you, you know, you want five versions, pay me five times, but they don't. They actually, I've found in the last few films, the budgets are getting thinner and thinner and thinner because there's more guys out there with laptops doing this. <laughs> so you, you have, you have, um, the mores of the time, you have uh, what's acceptable. Sometimes now some things are more acceptable in one area. It's like you can show more violence in films during a certain time, but then sensuality is censored. And then another depends on who's uh, running the, you know, the who are the gatekeepers are. After a certain time, that shifts and then you can show more eroticism, but then violence is, uh, is uh, passe. Um, do, do you... What do you feel about that as an artist that we're the same people, you know, nothing has really changed except for um, the day that, you know, what side of the bed we woke up on in the morning. Uh, and then it, it, it makes art kind of uh, it, the ebbs and flows. Yeah. I mean, that's all, that's all very true. It's, it's the demographics and you've got to look at who the producers are and what market are they trying to go for? Okay. The best example that I can use is going back to Cats and Dog or Rin Tin Tin, whatever you want to call it. One of the key financial people were the Christian Broadcasting Network, CBN. Okay. Now, they had some very, very specific mores and, and morals. Uh, for example, in the, the first season, Cats, the cop, good looking young cop with a dog, was living with this beautiful blonde who uh, Burt Leonard cast because he had a thing for blondes. So he put this gorgeous blonde who was the kids. It was a kid in there. It was her mother, his mother, and his father had died somehow. I don't know how. It's never explained. But the but the CBN people had a lot of problems accepting that cats could live in the same house with this blonde. And not being, you know, doing it with her. Yeah. Right? I mean, it, 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 it was odd. I mean, you don't live with a gorgeous woman and you're a, you're a good looking young guy and have a, or at least then you didn't have that kind of relationship. It just didn't work. And then there's this kid and a dog and, you know, they had a problem with it. Yet in the series, you could show scenes where the cop took out a revolver and blew somebody's head off. <laughs> they had no problem with that. So, yeah, 
and guys kicking the shit out of each other in bars and violence and blood flowing out of his nose. And, but yet they had a problem with him living with the blonde. Okay. So, we, you know, we scratched our heads. And so, you know what they did? They had to kill the girl. <laughs> they, they killed the blonde. They said, oh, well, she got in a car accident and tragic and they're all crying. Oh, that's the end of her. She's not going to be in season two. <laughs> so they killed her. So now it's just cats, the dog, and the kid. Uh, so if you watch the later episodes, you'll, you won't see a blonde anywhere near it. But then you look at, okay, who are the people making this decision? It was the Christian Broadcasting Network. And I think if you look at who makes the decisions on a lot of these films, there's usually a story, a backstory to it and why they made this decision. Just like the tide changes with the mores, you know, um, things become retro, you know, like several generations removed, the kids think that stuff that their parents or their parents' parents were, you know, contemporary, suddenly the kids think that's hip and new and fresh, but it's, you know, it's already been done. Uh, retro right now is, you know, over the last 10 years, 15 years is, you know, throwing back to those films of the grindhouse and of the, uh, the 70s and 80s. And then when, you know, a filmmaker like Eli Roth, like you mentioned, uh, yeah. Eli Roth, Tarantino, um, Robert Rodriguez, they do those grindhouse films and they have that feel. Like there's a difference between the remake of My Bloody Valentine and say Eli Roth's latest film, Thanksgiving. I watched Thanksgiving and then I saw an interview with him and he was saying is that he was influenced heavily by My Bloody Valentine, Happy Birthday to Me, Curtains, Prom Night, yeah. Um, old 70s films and you watch his film which is a schlocky uh, throwback to those films versus the remake of My Bloody Valentine My Bloody Valentine seemed like it was directed by somebody who was trying to class it up too much and wasn't trying to get into the spirit of what the other films were whereas Eli Roth didn't, didn't think that he was above the material he knew this is the kind of movie I'm going to do and even though the score isn't yours or isn't, um, you know, um, Carl's, it, it's not those older scores. It feels like those scores. It, it feels like it, of, of, do you think that imitation is the highest form of flattery? Oh, yeah. Yeah. I mean, you know, Eli, actually, he used some of my music on one of his films, I think Cabin Fever. Or, well, I can't remember what, what it was. But. Yeah, Cabin Fever. Yeah, he, he loved some music from Prom Night, so they licensed the piece. I was flattered. I was very flattered. I thought, geez, that's that's great. You you love this music so much, you want to put it in your movie. That's that's great. Are there things you have yet to do artistically that, given the opportunity, you you know are just raring to go? Like, what's something you have left let you have left to do that you have not done yet? Well, you know, there's there's a few things, but you know, the life changes too, and your your uh, ambitions change, and your health changes. Uh, so far, I'm I'm okay in that department. But one of the things that's kept me busy, and I'm having a great time with it, really. And you, you know, this this is going to segue back into what you were saying about everything old is new again, or everything new is old. Or I don't know how you put it, but kids. One of the things that the new generation have just become infatuated with, and I don't even understand it, is the phonograph record. The putting a needle on a piece of vinyl and dragging it through the grooves and having music come out. They seem, there's a huge, oh, I'm sure you know, a, a demand for vinyl now. And what I'm finding, I've been approached by several of them, fairly substantially, uh, you know, prominent record labels saying, we'd like to do a soundtrack al album on vinyl of Prom Night and My Bloody Valentine and Curtains. And I mean, this, this has been probably about a half a dozen that I've done so far. And I'm really getting a lot of fun out of going back to these old magnetic recordings and cleaning them up and cutting them down and making pieces out of all, a lot of times what are just, you know, little stings and cues, but making three minute pieces out of them that all join together, which you can do very easily now with, uh, you know, 
uh, editing programs on a computer, which I don't know how technical you are, but there's all kinds of programs now. Uh, Audacity, Logic 9, uh, Pro Tools, blah, 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 blah. So I'm dragging out a lot of these scores and making soundtrack albums, and they're ending up on people's phonographs and I'm getting great fan mail and I've made a few bucks and it's, it's just been a fun, a fun thing to do. And I'm still doing, in fact, there's one that's just coming out now. This is the finally, the uh, soundtrack for murder by decree is coming out of uh, a company in North Carolina. So yeah, it's been fun. You know, it's funny. You, you have slasher movies, um, even the highbrow ones, but you have slasher movies that a lot of the music is suspenseful and, you know, it's, um, you know, it's horror music, but every so often there's a piece that's in it that is very beautiful and very lush and is not, you know, so, so it, the movie has different uh, uh, flavors and, and tones. In Curtains, there's a piece called, I think it's called Striker's Studio. Yep. Um and it is so beautiful. It, it, it's it's a, a, a lush piano piece, and you you don't think it's from a horror movie. No, and it was intentionally done that way to give the film some scope and some you know balance. You you can't just play booga booga music for a hundred minutes, you know, because what's going to happen is you're going to wear your. It's going to get to the point where the music isn't scary anymore because you just heard it for the last twenty minutes. But if you take a break from it and you slow it down, or even sometimes silence works that way, you just have nothing. Then you come out with one note that can be so perfectly placed that, you know, it, it makes a real statement. That piano piece that you mentioned, uh, I felt that at that point in the movie, we needed something to take us bring us down a little bit. I mean, you know, that's what movies are. It's a roller coaster, right? You're high, you're low, you, you'll laugh, you'll cry, you'll kiss 10 bucks goodbye. I mean, it's that's what movies are all about. You have to have a ride. So, you know, and another example of that is in My Bloody Valentine. There's this beautiful string piece that I orchestrated when they're driving over the, uh, you can see the, uh, the horizon. And uh, it's a beautiful shot. Nova Scotia and this gorgeous piece that comes out of uh, it's like Gone with the Wind, you know? And what's it doing in a movie called My Bloody Valentine? Well, I'll tell you what it's doing. It's giving the movie some scope and allowing it to breathe. That was the thinking. So in wrapping up, so the the retro thing, the kids and the younger filmmakers that are making films today, listening to these podcasts and getting a chance to learn from, <laughs> yeah. getting a chance to learn from people that have done it uh, many times over. What advice would you give to young filmmakers today? And would you welcome, if they had the budget to do so, to reach out to somebody like yourself who could uh, class up their picture? Well, you know, there's a lot of a couple of questions there. I don't have any advice. I mean, filmmaking is is a talent. You know, you either have it or you don't. And many of these guys that I work with, like Clark, they made bad movies. They started off making horrible movies, and they learned from their mistakes. And because they were talented, they were able to to eventually make good movies. Uh, and I'm sure every young filmmaker today is trying his hand at making something and then it's, it's dying and they're saying, well, this doesn't work. What do I do? What do I learn from what I did wrong? And it's just the, the, the creative process. Basically you learn from your mistakes and try not to make the same ones over again. Um, so yeah, I, I say, yeah, go out, try and make the films. Um, I think the way they approach it today is a little differently because we've got the, like, the technical school, uh, tools, so you can, you can go out and shoot a movie on an iPhone, you know? I mean, Bob couldn't do that. He had to rent a, a camera and pay for film and get a crew, and a sound crew, and, you know, all, all these things, which cost money. So he had to talk somebody into putting up that money. <laughs> Today, you know, kids don't, you don't need all that financing. You can do it with very limited uh, money and, uh, and great technology. So, yeah, go out and do it in any way you can. Try and make the best movie you can. And as for, you know, collaborating with me, I to be very blunt, I haven't been asked. 
that's a that's a shame because there there's very few people that um, have a body of work um, such as yourself, you know, that's still working as far as um, you know. You've worked through different decades yeah. in in the independent and the you know the sm- the lower. Um, I would I don't know. I wouldn't call it lower. I mean, it's funny. My Bloody Valentine was produced independently, but it was released by uh, Paramount. So, Paramount, yeah. But yeah, but you've worked through different decades. So, I think that the filmmakers coming up today, they could benefit. They could benefit from working with composers such as yourself. Um, you know, instead of working with the kid that's in their film class, you know. Yeah, but you know what, Royce? That's always been the way with f- composers and filmmakers. That's traditionally like again hearkening back to two hours ago when we started this carl zetrer went to school with bob clark okay there was a there was an association a friendship a trust there he didn't go out and start going into the you know phone book looking for composers for his film he went to somebody he knew and trusted and grew up with and, and that very much is the way these kids do it today. Yeah, they're going to pick him, the guy who's the music whiz in the class, the film class. They'll probably ask him to do the movie. And he'll make mistakes, but they both will. And they'll figure out what the mistakes will, were, and they'll fix it. And they'll, they'll go forward. Uh, so nothing's really changed in that department. Um, yeah, I mean, some people could, and I'd be willing to talk to them, but I really haven't. I don't. I get a lot of fan mail, but I get people... You know, they'll send me a poster of Porky's and they want my signature on it, right? <laughs> or they'll send me a Christmas story uh, poster or CD and say, can you sign this and uh, send it back? Or tell me how great, or the favorite scene was, you know, you'll shoot your eye out and all that's that kind of stuff. That's, that's what they, that's what they write to me. They don't ask me for advice on scoring films. Um, one last thing, it just occurred to me. So uh, one person I did interview was uh, um, Harry Manfredini, who had scored a lot of the Friday 13th and a lot of other stuff. Yeah. And he mentioned he mentioned that when La La Land Records, Waxworks Records, when those guys put out a box set of his music, it took a very long time for that to be possible because all the old masters and the tapes were in the vaults at Paramount. Um, so it became very hard until they started putting out the remastered Blu-rays where they actually dusted off and found those tapes and those things. How has it been possible for you to put out soundtracks of Curtains and Prom Night and other films? Do you keep all your own masters or were they also in storage somewhere at studio and you had to get access to them? Very simple answer. I own a studio. So I, I own the studio that where the music was recorded. So I kept copies of all the masters. We call them safety masters, safety copies. It's sort of, think of it as like a backup disc. Yeah. So when it came time to put out these albums, I had everything. I didn't have to go and find a lab in Hollywood and beg their permission to get the masters from them. I already had them. And when you license them, when you're an independent contractor that gets hired to do the music for the films that you do the music for, is it, it, do you make it where you own the masters so this kind of thing is possible? Or do you have to contact the, the film, the production entity that made those films and, and get the license to put out your own music? No, um, there's, this is a complicated thing, which I won't get into because we're running out of time, but there's, there's different versions of rights. There's mechanical rights, there's sync rights, there's, uh, copyrights, there's publishing rights. And for almost every film that I did, I retained the master recording rights and the publishing rights, which gave me the copyright, uh, the, the ability to release these things independently. In other words, I didn't have to get their permission to release my own music. And sometimes this became a contractual sticking point. Um, In the early days, to be very blunt, they didn't even know what those rights were. All they cared about was, you know, just get get the music and, ha- and have it ready by Friday. They, did, they didn't know anything about publishing rights because it wasn't their thing. These aren't music publishers. These are film companies. As the decades went on, somebody got the bright idea, hey, there's money in publishing. We should, we should 
get into that. So you got all these film companies opening up their little publishing companies, not having a clue what they even were, but they knew that there might be money at the back end somewhere. I don't remember a film like Porky's ever having a soundtrack with your music on it. No, and there never was. And um, one of the one of the reasons, and this may sound bizarre, but I mean, if you think about it, there wouldn't be much music on on that album to put on. We, I don't even know if you could come up with fifteen minutes of music because just play the movie and you'll see what I mean. There's not there's not a lot of music in Porky's. No, there's there's Patsy Cline uh, singing a song. There's you know there, there, yeah I can't give you that. A, <laughs> yeah, no, no, no. Uh, but but there's soundtracks that come out where you can have some score and then some of those yeah. um, the songs. But I'm I'm surprised that it just never came out at the time. No, no, they didn't because the film. If you knew the producers, Don Carmody, Bob Clark, uh, Harold Greenberg, they were just happy to get this movie finished. The the film ran out of money. There was no there was no money to finish it. So Harold Greenberg, a Canadian company who owns El Astral Bellevue Pathé, came in and dumped a half a million bucks in to finish it, took a huge chunk of it, uh, became very rich from it. But um, they, weren't, they weren't thinking about the aftermarket and T-shirts and posters and, you know, the soundtrack album. No, they, just, they were just so happy to get the thing finished and get it into the theaters. Harold got his tax write off. Bob got his auto buyer Gershie finished it went into the theaters the kids loved it this thing made to let bob alone probably made 20 million dollars just on the first year from that film so you know it was a huge huge hit i mean 200 million dollars back then was a huge box office gro gross today by today's standards you're lucky if you can break even if you make 200 million well i want to i want to thank uh our uh, gracious guest for sitting down with us and doing this interview because it has been so insightful to go back into the, I, I like to call it the way back machine, going back in time <laughs> and uh, reminiscing and learning um, about the, how it just the nuts and bolts and how this, how this stuff is done. Um, and I thank you for taking the time to do that because a lot of the people getting into film now, they don't, they think it's sunshine and rainbows and they don't know that, uh, you know, there's cautionary tales. There's some things, this is kind of how it was done by mustache twirling, uh, you know, moguls and, you know, and some of those people are luckily being taken to task today for how they conduct themselves and we're trying to do better. So I appreciate you shedding some light on that so we can see how film gets made. <laughs> yeah. Well, you, everything you said is right on the money, Royce. And uh, hopefully this will either inspire <laughs> or deter some young filmmakers from getting into it. I hope it inspires them. Well, it uh, sounds like it sounds like filmmakers definitely shouldn't be having uh, um, the f bombs being part of their vernacular, like Mr. Simpson. Uh, doesn't sound like that's <laughs> doesn't sound like that's the best way to conduct ourselves. Well, you know, I, what can I say? There's there's two ways to go about getting something what you want and that's probably not the way i would recommend doing it but anyway i mean uh hopefully this has uh, been entertaining and educational at some level thank you all right well um it has been royce freeman signing off for ttft and catch you next time thanks royce